In this video, we're going to discuss a thermodynamic system. How do we define it and what are some important characteristics of thermodynamic systems for us to know in order to study thermochemistry? So first off, it's very uh, particular how you denote or define a thermodynamic system, right? So let's say we have some object that we're going to define as the system, right? So I'll just write system here. Right? The system can be anything. It can be whatever, whatever you're interested in studying its energy change, that is the system, whether it's a chemical reaction, whether it's a gas container, whatever you're interested in studying, how energy is flowing from and to that object, that is the system. Right? So if you're going to define your system, it's going to be important for you to define the boundary that separates that system from everything else. Right? So I'm going to just put a little boundary here. This is our boundary. Right now, this could be so for example, if you have some chemical reaction that's occurring in a vessel, um, and it's in a water bath, right, the, uh, the vessel that container is going to those container walls, that's going to be the boundary that separates your system from everything else, right? Or if you have just a pot of water, right? Um, the pot itself is going to be the boundary and the water is what you're interested in. That's the system, right? So you can kind of see how anything you want to study, you can say, okay, this is the system. And then what is the boundary that separates it from everything else? Now, everything else is what we're going to call the surroundings, right? So I'm going to draw a dotted line around our system and boundary here. Right, so everything else is the surrounding. And depending on how your system is constructed, the surroundings can be very specific or the surroundings can be rather vast, right? So think about the example, like I said, with a, a chemical reaction occurring in a water bath, right? That water bath can be big enough that it can be considered the surroundings. You can make measurements in the water bath and get information about how energy is flowing to your system. Now, if we take the example, the other example of a pot of water, right? If you have an open pot of water, then the entire room is the surroundings, right? If you're just, you just have it open to, to air, right? So every, the surroundings can actually be very specific or it can be rather vast depending on how you've set up your thermodynamic system, how you've set up your experiment. Now, there are three different types of systems uh, that it's important for us to classify um, these different types of systems. So the first one is what I'm going to call an open system. And I'm going to go into more detail of these three in just a second. But you can have an open system, you can have a closed system, and then you can have an isolated system. And the difference between these three types of systems is whether energy or matter is allowed to escape. I should say energy and or matter is allowed to escape from these systems. In an open system, both energy and matter can escape, right? So we have energy can be transferred to and from this system and matter can be transferred to and from this system. So what do I mean here? Let's stick with the example of a pot of water, right? Let's say you're boiling a pot of water on a stove, right? Um, you're boiling that water, heat is escaping from the system, right? Because heat is allowed to escape from a pot, whether it's through the sides. If you touch the sides of a pot, it gets really hot, right? That's because energy is allowed to escape there. Uh, but also, if you're boiling that water, then gas particles, gaseous water, water vapor is escaping from that pot as well, right? So you have energy and matter escaping from that system. That's going to be an open system. That's what we refer to as an open system. Now, in the context of a closed system, in a closed system, energy is allowed to escape. Right? So you have energy that can be transferred in and out, but matter cannot be transferred in and out of a closed system. Right? So matter is not allowed in or out of a closed system. So kind of sticking with this analogy, right? If you put a sealed lid on your pot, right? Then no uh, gas can escape from the pot. It's now a closed system. But if obviously if you still touch the sides, then you're still going to feel heat. If you put your hand above it, you'll still feel that heat. 
escaping, that energy escaping, uh, but matter is now no, uh, no longer able to escape from a closed system, right? So that's, that's the definition of a closed system. And an isolated system is the case where energy and matter cannot be transferred in or out of an isolated system. Got an isolated system, energy nor matter can transfer out, right? So that's going to be no go for both of these guys. Right. So um, now an isolated system, I will say there are very few truly isolated systems in reality. For the most part, an isolated system is really just a theoretical construct that we're able to build up thermodynamics in. But you can think about an isolated system sticking with this pot example. If we were to put some sort of insulating material around the pot, right? So not only does it have a, a lid on it, we also put some insulating material around it so that energy can't transfer out. That will be a, an approximation of an isolated system, right? You put some material around it where if you, if you were to touch it, you wouldn't feel that heat, right? That, that's going to be a best real life approximation for an isolated system. But most systems that you'll see in reality will either be open or closed, right? So it's going to be important for us to not only define what our system is, but what are the confines of what can escape or be transferred in to our system, right? Can we... Can it, can it release energy? Can it release its matter as well to the surroundings, right? Okay, so now in thermodynamics, oftentimes we're discussing energy transfers, right? Uh, we're, trying, we're interested in how energy is transferring to and from a, our system, right? So let's look at two different scenarios, right? So let's say we've defined some system, right? And we got some surroundings. Right, and I'll just use S-U-R-R -R for surroundings, right? So we've got a system and a surroundings. Now, if our system is releasing heat, this is what we call an energy releasing process, right? So let's say energy is going to our surroundings, right? So this is going to be the direction of our energy transfer. Energy is being transferred from the system to the surroundings, right? So that means that there's going to be a drop in the energy of the system. Right, so I'm using uh, delta E to denote that there is a change in energy, and I put a negative sign there because that means that the energy is going to drop. If the energy is being transferred from the system to the surroundings, then that means that our energy of our system is dropping. But because of the law of conservation of energy, if the system, if the energy for our system drops, that means the energy of the surroundings must increase. Right, so it's going to be a, a, a change in energy for our surroundings as well. That's gonna be an increase in energy for our surroundings. So this would be an energy releasing process. Got energy releasing. And obviously by contrast, we can have an energy absorbing process, right? So let's have our system here again, build up our surroundings. Right, so we got the surroundings here, right? So let's say that the surroundings is transferring energy to the system. So now this is the direction of our energy transfer. Well, if that's the case, then that means that we're going to have an increase in energy for our system and a decrease in energy for our surroundings, right? So this is going to be an energy absorbing process. Now, these signs of energy transfer and energy change are very important. Um, and in the next video, we're going to discuss how this uh, relates to heat and work, what those the signs of heat and work mean for energy transfer. But in thermodynamics and thermochemistry, it's going to be very important to keep track of your signs, right? It's something gaining energy, gaining heat. Um, it's going to be, be very important that you keep uh, track of these signs. So these processes, uh, the ones that we outlined here may seem rather trivial, but as it gets more involved, it's going to be very important for you to keep track of what's going on with the sign of your energy transfer.